Great. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, uh, as uh, Marco said, my name is Doug Hellman. I'm a senior developer at DreamHost. And I'm going to talk today about uh, some work that I did over the past year, um, and actually the past several years, looking at the architectures of different programs that use dynamic code loading um, and how they used plugins in different ways. Um, and then what we did with that uh, on some work on a project uh, for OpenStack over the past year and uh, a, a library that I've released as well. Uh, so from my analysis, that, uh, the research that I did, I counted any application or framework that loads code dynamically uh, at runtime to be using plugins. So I'm not talking about things like uh, delayed uh, execution of import statements that are embedded in functions and things like that. I'm talking about uh, actually dynamically discovering code, finding the module, and loading it. Um, in most cases, the name uh, of the lo or the location of the code wasn't known to the application or the framework at, uh, at, uh, at the beginning, that it, it was given to it th through some sort of external configuration. Um, before we talk about how to use plugins, we should talk a little bit about why to use plugins in your applications. And there's lots of good reasons. Uh, first, uh, the main one is keeping a separation between the core of your application and the extensions to your application. Did the mic cut out? Okay, sorry, I, I stopped being able to hear. Um, encourages you to build it in such a way that you use better abstractions within your application. Um, so building an extensible program like that can take more work and maybe a little more time and resources than hardwiring everything together. But in the long run, it pays off because you end up with something that's more flexible and more maintainable. Uh, packaging extensions separately also reduces dependency bloat on your main application. Uh, so it makes deployment easier to manage because you can control which dependencies have to be installed based on which plugins you actually care about using. Uh, plugins are also a good way to implement things like device drivers and other uh, occurrences of the strategy pattern. Uh, they let you put your core logic in the application where it's easily reusable and then let the plugins focus on uh, talking to a device or an API or something like that. And they also uh, provide a convenient way to extend the features of your application uh, by hooking new code in and well-defined extension points. So you'll find, as I have in a few cases, that people use your application in ways that you would never have expected. But because you've built it with extension, extension points, they can do whatever they want with it. And finally, having an extensible system makes it easier for other developers to contribute to your project by building those extra uh, packages and distributing them indirectly so uh, you don't have to have all of that code in your core repository, which makes uh, code reviews and, and accepting patches and that sort of thing easier because they can just sort of manage their own thing. So I've spent a fair bit of time over the past couple of years studying plugin-based architect, uh, architectures, and especially over the last year while helping to create Solometer, the new metering component for OpenStack. Solometer measures the resources being used in a cloud deployment so that we can build the tenants for those resources. So we collect data like uh, what you would expect, lifetimes of instances, the amount of disk space that's been used, uh, network I.O., that sort of thing. Uh, however, the type and number of things that a given cloud deployment will want to measure and will want to bill for will vary from uh, deployment to deployment. So we wanted a flexible system to make taking all of those measurements easy to extend and easy to control. Uh, we need to allow deployers to write their own plugins. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. They may have things that they want to measure that we haven't implemented yet in the core, or they may have things that they need to measure in some sort of custom way, uh, which is a case that we have at DreamHost where it's not something reusable, it's a deployment implementation detail for our cloud. So we're expecting a lot of developers who don't uh, interact with us directly to be building these plugins. So another key thing for us was to make it easy to document the API for each plugin set. Uh, so that they had clear instructions for what they needed to do to create uh, plugins. So with all of these things in mind, we designed Solometer to be flexible in several different areas. And this is a diagram that explains what the uh, OpenStack system sort of looks like. Um, <clears throat> it's a collection of components that cooperate to provide infrastructure as a service features for a cloud. Uh, each component manages a different aspect of the cloud and then uses a message bus to communicate between the components. Uh, all of the components generate notification messages uh, when events happen, so when you create an instance or when you delete an instance, that sort of thing. And capturing those messages was the first source of data for Solometer because it triggered an event. We knew exactly, you know, this is something we care about. We want to measure this. 
However, the notifications are formatted in a way that contain different metadata depending on the resource that triggered the event. Uh, so we needed a set of plugins in the event listener to translate those notification messages into a standard format for our metering system. Uh, there aren't events for all of the things that we care about measuring. Uh, for example, uh, CPU utilization, that doesn't really trigger events. We just need to poll for that. So we created a separate set of pollster uh, plugins to poll for data. Um, we check periodically you know, all sorts of different things that don't trigger events, but that are sort of run long running kinds of things. <clears throat> um, some of the other pollsters that uh, don't run on the hypervisor directly run in a central node where they can poll other services within OpenStack in, in for uh, similar sorts of uh, measurements where there are, again, no events happening. <clears throat> All of the Solometer services use a separate message bus to deliver data uh, to a collector process. Uh, and then the collector process uses a storage driver to write them to a database. And the, uh, the storage driver su API supports relational and non-relational databases. We've abstracted out the events that are the, the operations that have to happen at that layer so that the deployer has the option to deploy something that they're comfortable with. And if there's anything that we've learned with OpenStack is that no two deployments are the same in any real way. Um, so this architecture that we came up with resulted in five different sets of plugins for Solometer. Uh, OpenStack includes a message bus abstraction layer already, so uh, including drivers for AMQP and 0MQ, so that part was implemented and we didn't really have to touch that or do anything with that. But the other four sets of plugins we created from scratch. So we have plugins for processing those notification messages, uh, pollsters for the compute nodes and for the central uh, nodes, and then the storage drivers. The designs that we came up with use patterns that we found by examining other uh, applications and frameworks. Um, so during my research, I looked at a few projects that I was already familiar with, and I looked at several that I hadn't actually used before, but that I knew used plugins. And this is a, a short list. I'm sure that there, I know that there are other applications and frameworks out there that have uh, different kinds of plugin systems, but this list gave us enough information to uh, come up with some designs that were reusable for us. Uh, Blogafile and Sphinx are two different apps for working with different forms of text uh, and uh, for publishing, and they use extensions primarily to add new content processing features. Mercurial is a command line app that can be extended with new subcommands, and Cliff is a library that I wrote that is uh, used for building applications in the same sort of way, so it, it, where you have subcommands for a main application. A virtual end wrapper is a command, another kind of command line tool. It uses hooks in a little bit of a different way. Most of the hooks for a virtual env wrapper uh, extend the features of the commands themselves without adding new commands. Uh, Nose and Track are common developer tools. You've probably seen or used those. Uh, it's much more likely that you've used them that you've written, than that you've written an extension for them, but they do uh, both use plugins. Django, Pyramid, and SQL Alchemy are developer libraries that use plugins, <clears throat> or at least load code dynamically at runtime. Uh, Diamond is a monitoring app with an extensive set of plugins, uh, and it does some things similar to what Solometer does, but in a sort of, sort of different, um, it looks at it from a different perspective. So we were building some similar things, but uh, we wanted to look at their architecture, but we couldn't really use what they had. Uh, Nova is the primary component for OpenStack, uh, and it, it relies on a large number of drivers for managing all the different aspects and the configurable ways that you can deploy uh, OpenStack. So I looked at all of this code uh, over the course of a few months uh, to derive ideas for how uh, plugins should be used in the right way and um, to design the way that we would use plugins within Solometer. So while some of what I might say today will sound a little critical of the other applications, keep in mind that I had the benefit of looking at not only all of the code all at the same time um, and in hindsight, but also probably different requirements that some of these uh, applications had. And we made a few choices differently than uh, almost all of these programs. So, um, All right, so let's talk about how plugins work. So the first thing that you have to do with a plugin is to find it. So the tools that I looked at were split uh, between some sort of explicit definition of what plugins were, were to be used or scanning the uh, installed set of code to look for plugins. And each of those sets was then further divided between <coughs> Uh, what was being listed or scanned. So some were looking for files, you know, .py or .pyc files, and some were looking for Python import references. 
Uh, so that's either a, a reference to a module or something within a module. The explicit import reference category here is just basically uh, there's an import uh, string in a config file somewhere. Um, and then the scan import reference category means that there's a, a registry of all of the things that they, the plugins could be loaded from. And uh, in, this, in all the cases uh, where that happened, uh, all of them used setup tools and package resources with uh, entry points. So after the app finds a plugin, the next step is to decide whether to load it and use it. Uh, most of the applications and frameworks use an explicit step to configure extensions. And there are a lot of times when this makes sense. When you're doing something with developer tools like Django, it makes a lot of sense because you're really hardwiring things together. It's just that the framework doesn't know about the things that you're loading. Um, the extensions to SQL Alchemy are all enabled when you load the library, uh, but it, it decides which one to load based on your database connection string. So that makes sense. There's no reason to load drivers you're not going to use. Uh, however, some of the user applications like uh, Blogafile, Mercurial, and Track, in addition to installing the plugin, you have to take an extra step to configure it and enable it. Um, and <clears throat> That seemed like something that could really be skipped. So when I created Virtual Enwrapper and Cliff, um, I decided to use installation as a trigger for activation because I wanted to vo avoid any opportunity for the user to make a mistake in that configuration. As long as they could get the code on the system, it would be available and it would work. Uh, and that's, uh, Nose works uh, in a similar way. As soon as you install the plugin, it's available and, and uh, you can use it. Uh, whether or not it's actually turned on depends on what kind of command line flags you pass to Nose when you call it though. So. All right, after the application decides whether or not to load a plugin, the next step is to actually do the loading and get the code. Uh, all of the examples that I looked at used uh, two different techniques, either calling import explicitly, either through the built-in uh, dunder import function, or using the imp module, or import live, or something like that, uh, or by using package resources to get entry points. Uh, some of you will have, fa maybe fast readers, will have noticed that the nose SQL Alchemy and Blogafile uh, are all listed on both sides of the table there, and that's not a mistake. All three of those actually use both techniques to load their plugins. So Nose falls back to a custom importer if uh, package resources is not installed, not available. SQL Alchemy uses a custom importer for extensions distributed with the core application or library, but then it uses package resources to load things that are not distributed with core. And Blogafile uses package resources uh, to find plugins, and then it manually scans the directories containing the plugins to find things inside the plugins. So things like templates and, and that sort of thing. So if I discount the packages that I created myself uh, that are in italics there, uh, there's a pretty clear bias towards uh, scanning the files or, uh, sorry, uh, importing with the custom import code. Um, that route seems easy at first, but every example uh, in every application, I was able to find a problem just with simple code inspection, so not even actually running the code. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, all right, after the code for the extension is imported, the next step is to integrate it with the rest of the app, and that's a step where you configure any hooks in the application that need to know about the plugin, and then maybe you pass some state into the plugin so that it knows about the application. Uh, I looked at this step along two different axes. Again, uh, first I considered the granularity of the plugin interface, and I counted anything that was uh, using a single class or function as being fine-grained plugin. So the, the plugin was a, a standalone bit of code, and the, uh, the application loaded that bit of code into memory directly. Uh, for more coarse-grained cases, uh, a single plugin might include hooks into multiple parts of the application that are all loaded <coughs> um, by the application or, or probed for by the application differently. And the other axis related to integration looks at how the code provided by the plugin is brought into the application. And I found two techniques for doing that. Um, first, the application can instruct the plugin to integrate itself. So that's usually the case like with Sphinx where you have a setup function and it's passed in application context and then setup is responsible for calling methods on the application context to integrate itself with the application. Um, that can also be done implicitly if you're using a library like zope.interface where just the act of importing things causes them to be integrated in the same way. 
And the other way to do it is uh, ap the application can load the plugin and then interrogate it. So it can uh, look at its properties or call methods on it to discover what the plugin wants to do or what it needs. One common issue with dynamically loaded code is enforcing the plugin API at runtime. And this is always a potential issue with dynamic languages, but it comes up frequently with plugins because they're typically written by someone other than the core application developers. And especially if they're distributed separately, you have the opportunity for things like the API to drift a little bit and then the plugin's no longer compatible. Um, I saw two basic uh, techniques being used to help developers get their plugins right. Uh, on the left are the applications that rely on some conventions, either naming conventions or locations of files or that sort of thing. And many of these also had coarse-grained API interfaces. Uh, on the right are applications where the plugin uses some sort of a class hierarchy. And in the case of Nose, uh, that base class is optional, so it's kind of a quasi-interface. Uh, track, on the other hand, uses formal interfaces with uh, zope.interface. And Diamond actually enforces a strict subclassing, so you have to subclass from their collector class. So for Cliff, I chose to use the ABC module, uh, which is the abstract base class module in the standard library, uh, but I stuck with duct typing for the actual uh, application, so the application doesn't check that you've subclassed it correctly. And that means that the developer can use the base class if they want to, to get some hints, but they don't absolutely have to if it's inconvenient for some reason. And the final dimension that I looked at was how the plugin was actually used at runtime. And there were three different primary patterns for, for invoking the plugin. Uh, that I found. Uh, drivers are lo typically loaded one at a time and invoked directly. Um, then the, the, some apps use a dispatcher pattern where they load all of the extensions, but then based on what event or data they have, they decide which ones to call at runtime. And then other apps use an iterator pattern where they load all of the extensions and all of the events or all of the data is given to all of the plugins um, so that they can participate in the processing. All right, so after all of that analysis, what did we end up doing with Salometer? For finding and loading, we decided to use entry points because they were just the simplest solution all around. I mentioned that the apps that were doing their own custom import code, uh, whether they were using import strings or whether they were loading files by munging the import path, uh, every, every one of them had some sort of edge case error or weirdness that just don't do that. Um, Entry points are easier to install and configure because your user doesn't have to know where your code is. They don't have to know what file something is in. They just have to know the name of the thing that they want to use or turn on. Um, they're also um, easier for packagers because they support multiple formats. You can distribute the metadata as part of a platform package as well, so it doesn't even have to be a Python package. Uh, we used package resources, but there are alternate implementations of entry point-like systems in other libraries. None of them are as widely used by far, uh, and so we just decided to go with the tried and true version in package resources because we could trust it. Um, and then to further simplify the implementation, we decided to always use entry points for all of our plugins, so no mixing and matching different techniques um, and no special cases. We came up with a somewhat novel solution for managing which plugin is enabled at runtime. Uh, for Solometer, for collecting the data, we, we wanted to default to collect everything, uh, but then allow deployers to disable certain plugins if they just knew they weren't going to use that data. Uh, the solution we came up with was to use an explicit configuration file, but then to invert it from what you would normally do. So instead of listing what they want enabled, they list what they want disabled. So we load every plugin that we find and then, uh, unless it's disabled in that configuration file. Um, <clears throat> all right, Solometer plugins also have a chance, in addition to that configuration file, to automatically disable themselves, which is useful in some of those pollster plugins. Uh, for example, if they're loaded on a system where they don't talk to that kind of hypervisor, there's really no sense in polling them repeatedly and just getting warning messages or error messages from them. So the plugin API actually has a method that asks the plugin whether it should be enabled. For our integration pattern, we went with a fine-grained API using inspection. Uh, there's a separate namespace for each type of plugin, and each plugin instance refers to a single class. The application loads and instantiates the class and then calls methods on it to figure out what notifications it wants or what um, me meter data it's going to provide. 
And this lets us have the repetitious setup code in each plugin and, and implemented by each of the plugin authors. And instead, the plugin provides a little bit of metadata with simple returning lists of strings and that sort of thing. So it's very easy for the plugin authors. The instances of the plugins don't know about the application. They're not given that, the application context. And they don't know about each other at all. Uh, and they only run when the application actively invokes them. They're not supposed to start threads or run in the background or anything like that. And that makes them very easy to isolate in a test framework. To define the API itself, for each set of plugins, we created a separate abstract base class using the ABC module, as I mentioned. Uh, this gives us a way to document the plugin API in a single place with that class. And then developers who use the class as their base class get a little bit of help for free to make sure they've implemented the full API. Since we don't enforce the class hierarchy, though, we also watch for any unexpected errors anytime we call into the plugin. So we're trapping all the exceptions and, and dealing with them. We used all three of the invocation patterns in different places. Uh, we only use one storage system at a time, so we treat that like a driver. Uh, we load all of the notification plugins, but then dispatch messages to them based on what events they want to see. And then we load all of the pollster plugins and iterate through them on a regular basis in, the, in that agent. So after we had all of this working inside Solometer, I extracted some of the code into a standalone library called Stevedore. And it wraps package resources with a series of manager classes that provides a little bit of a nicer API as well as some caching. Each manager takes a namespace as an argument for loading the entry points. And then it, it works with the plugins depending on the uh, nature of the manager. So for example, <clears throat> the named extension manager only loads the plugins that you have explicitly told it to load. So it'll find all of them, but it'll only load some of them. Um, and that's useful if you have an explicit activation sort of configuration style. Now, most of the managers have a map method that lets you uh, eliminate for loops in your code where you would loop over the list of all of the managers, and you basically pass a closure into the map function or the map method um, along with some, some data if you need it. Um, and then the manager takes care of calling it, trapping all of the errors, and that sort of thing. The uh, enabled extension manager uses a test function to check whether the plugin should be used after it has been loaded. So we use this in Solometer where we want to give the plugins a chance to disable themselves. So the, the uh, manager takes care of calling the right API for us. And basically, it loads the code, but it ignores the plugin after that if it's not going to be used. Uh, the dispatch extension manager uses a test function as an argument to map to figure out which plugin needs to receive whatever data and, and be called. Um, so that makes it, again, easy to load all of your extensions, but pass the right data to the, the ones that expect it. And then the driver manager operates on a single plugin and gives the caller direct access to the, the driver, the plugin itself, instead of hiding it behind the map call. Stevedore is part of, uh, or it's used in OpenStack, but it doesn't depend on any of the other OpenStack libraries. Um, so it can be used in any of your applications if you're considering using uh, extensible architectures like this. So if you're interested in adding plugins, I hope you'll take a look at it. And that's it. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I think they're working their way to the, yeah. Uh, could you just elaborate on like what some of those uh, edge cases for doing the custom imports? Right. Um, so if you, if you add a bunch of extra directories to your import path, and this was something that I think I found in Diamond, you can't name your plugins in a way that uses the same file name because uh, you have to worry, it, it, it's the same thing as having two top-level packages installed in site packages with the same name. The importer doesn't know which one to load, and you'll get the wrong one. So th that's an example, but there's lots of little things like uh, files being in different places or not having them configured correctly, that sort of thing. Howdy. I think it's kind of unfortunate that people are talking over Q&A, but it can't be helped. Um, as a warm-up, are you familiar uh, offhand with PEP 302? I probably should be, but the number is not ringing a bell. Uh, PEP 302 is the meta import hook 
and okay. machinery. So it is allowed, it is a way for a Python program to at any point choose to customize the way that it imports. Okay. Um, the way that the import statement functions at all levels. Um, and I mention this because I have a feeling you're not familiar with a library called Exoset. Exoset. Oh yeah, yeah. That that was the punchline. Uh, Exoset is a library that modifies the way that Python imports things, such that you can ask Exoset to load a module without technically importing it. It doesn't appear in sysstop modules, and if that module that you've loaded tries to import things, Exoset may choose to deny them, or it may choose to replace them with things that are not actually the things that I wanted to import. So um, for example, you could create a synthetic import that is only available to that plugin. You can prevent the plugin from doing things like importing threading, importing multiprocessing, importing inspect, et cetera. And I was just curious as to what your opinion is on this style since you didn't appear to review any packages that use this kind of uh, Yeah, I was dogmatic. not aware of Exoset, so thank you for that. Um, the it sounds like something I would not want to use because it changes the way the behavior of the ecosystem works. Um, it's intriguing, but I, as a developer of a plugin, I wouldn't want that sort of restriction. So I'm not sure that I would want to place that restriction on my plugin authors either. Okay, but you did say that you generally don't want people to write ill-behaved plugins. Uh, yeah, but we're all consenting adults. So it, I mean, I, I figure. We're writing a bunch of plugins ourselves, and if the deployer writes some bad code, then that's up to them to deal with. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Great presentation. And I'll take a look at Exoset. That sounds cool. Thanks. Anybody else? All right. Thanks.